Um, so we're here for this work session, and we just have one item on our agenda, which is the financial strategic plan. Laura, are you going to just do a visual roll call? That's fine. Okay. So I think you already did it. I did. <laughs> All right. And uh, Donna is uh, probably not able to join us tonight. So Rob, do you want to take it away? I do. Thank you, Board President Marcus Board members. Uh, tonight, we, uh, um, Bill is going to be presenting on our draft strategic financial plan and how that relates to our budget process. I think he's going to start with a little bit of history on why we do a draft uh, strategic financial plan um, and, uh, and then how it this will call kick is us now off being recorded. for the 21-22 budget season. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to our CFO, Bill Sutter. Bill. Um, um, so for, for a little uh, history, I guess, um, just uh, uh, why we are doing this document, uh, what purpose it serves. Um, the, a number of years ago, maybe pushing 15 or so, we started um, making these documents uh, that were, um, it was actually requested by DAC uh, to have a, a more of a summary of the budget document to make it a little easier to um, digest the the 300 odd pages that are in the budget book um, down to something uh, um, uh, summary information uh, and then um, I believe it was Tom Myers that suggested having a place where we capture um, uh, our assumptions going forward into the budget process so that we sort of document that along the way uh, in one single place. So um, this document uh, developed, or I think we're like four or five years into it now, um, to uh, with a little different spin on it. So we've got some uh, student information in there. Um, uh, as well as comparison uh, to other districts. Uh, so I'll walk through all of this, but uh, really it's, a, it's a, a place where we kick off the, the budget cycle for next year um, with some summary information, uh, that comparison, that what do we look uh, as a district compared to others, uh, and then also those assumptions uh, going forward, some economic outlook. Uh, so with that, I will jump into the presentation. Oh, I think question? Tina's raising her hand. Oh, Tina. I know that's not effective. Um, I have a quick question. So we we've had this doc we've had an, a document that looked well produced the last couple years. That was a pamphlet. That was and is this that same document or is this different? Yeah, eight and a half by eleven paper document. Okay. And and then this is a little this has changed though significantly from last year. Is that correct? No. No? Okay. It just felt different. So I was just making sure I'm on the same one. Okay. Correct. I can't think of another document we made. Um but yeah, no, this is the same one booklet form. Yeah. Uh, okay. Perfect. So we've been reviewing this every year for the last four years, right? More or yes. less? Yes. Okay. Bill, okay. um, can I ask one more question? I'm sorry. Sure. How many people do we hand this out to? Um, well, it's available on the website. It's on the um, financial transparency page. Um, historically, we would make, well, whenever we had a, a presentation with uh, DAC, we would hand it out or uh, public, um, any public meetings. Um, we didn't hand out too many last year. Um, probably won't hand out too many this year, but definitely electronically available. Okay, thanks. Let's see. Okay, so uh, we start out, we've got a, a little summary of the uh, strategic plan. 
of the outcomes and strategic themes that are defined within that. Uh, again, this is a lot of review uh, for board members, uh, but again, just a, a high level place where we capture this uh, for the public. Uh, we then go into a fairly uh, detailed explanation of some of the impacts of um, how school finance works, um, Tabor, uh, the Gallagher Amendment. We had to update this section uh, on page four uh, this year to address uh, the passage of um, with the Amendment B. Uh, I mean, we're referencing uh, amend, uh, Referendum C and Amendment 23 again in here to their, their uh, impacts to school finance and school funding uh, that um, there are a lot of folks in our community that uh, have joined us well after these things have passed. So they are uh, just part of how things work now. Uh, and so this is a reminder that these things exist out there. Uh, next, we get into the budget stabilization factor and uh, the, the running tally uh, impact to uh, Boulder Valley on page six. So we're up over $330 million, uh, uh, including the projection for next year uh, of the impact of the budget stabilization factor uh, on Boulder Valley. Uh, it is projected uh, with the governor's budget to uh, be significantly reduced uh, by about half uh, for next year. Uh, so uh, uh, an improvement uh, to the to the negative factor for next year. Uh, page seven, we have our uh, mill levies, so our property tax rates. So on uh, this graphic at the the center of the page there, uh, the dark blue at the bottom, that's our total program funding. So that's the basic school finance act of 25.023 mills. Uh, the light blue on top of that is our uh, general general mill levy override. Uh, the green uh, that's about seven to nine mills uh, over the past few years, that's our bond redemption. So our debt payments. Uh, we have the transportation mill levy override that's about one mill in yellow, uh, a very small thin red line for abatement. So this is uh, any property taxes that are uh, abated through the typical um, challenge process. Uh, we get uh, that funding the following year. Uh, and then the darker green uh, or Kelly green at the top, uh, four mills, that's our um, operations and technology override. So um, I guess I'll, I'll dig into the, um, the mill levy, the general fund mill levy override, the basic school finance act piece, uh, that 25 mills at the bottom. So the, there's legislation that will allow the legislature to, um, uh, or technically through CDE set what that mill uh, would be. It's been set at 27, but there's a credit of two mills. Uh, and there's discussion uh, happening at the legislature right now of how to implement that. And the question is whether the legislation is going to essentially say shall or may. That's a very big distinction when it comes to uh, whether a district has the ability to do something unilaterally or uh, has to make that choice. So um, essentially the question is going to come down to will we be required to increase our mills up to 27? Uh, the discussion has been around uh, no more than one mill per year uh, and will it be able to just happen uh, or will districts have to go ask their uh, constituents for that increase. Um, talking amongst my colleagues, we are pretty uh, firm that this is not something that should be um, uh, a choice. This is part of the School Finance Act. Uh, those mills are set, and so they should be set at whatever they need to be set at. Uh, and uh, it's not a, a choice at the local level uh, as to what that should be. Um, because it would result in a, 
a reduction of state funding uh, if a district and, and a reduction in overall funding if a district didn't set that mill levy uh, at the higher amount. Um, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll know more when the legislature comes back into session uh, in February as this uh, continues to roll out. Um, part of the discussion too is around uh, getting the Kathy can probably speak to this much more eloquently than I can, but the um, interrogatory, uh, I believe, is the term uh, to get the Supreme, the state Supreme Court, to uh, determine whether uh, this would be legal for them to do it. And so they sort of have to put it into legislation and have it get through the process a ways uh, before the Supreme Court will take it up. They won't take it up until uh, there's been some uh, passage of it in some way, shape, or form. I get that. All right. Um, so, so uh, some fairly significant changes to the to the um, uh, practice of the legislature. Hey, Bill, I think he's got a question. I'm sorry. Oh, oh go ahead, Kitty. Okay. So I do have a question about the, you know. Well, I can't read it here, but 25 point something, 023 versus 27, the legislature can just authorize that and it's a hike in property taxes that the voters don't vote on. Is that right? So this has to do with, um, so no. Okay. <laughs> I'm reading Kathy's reaction. <laughs> Kitty, we voted on this 100 years ago when we voted to allow us to raise our mills regardless of whatever the source was. I mean, it was we debruced, and oh. it's, it's complicated, but the question, the, the simple answer is we've already voted on it, even if it was 100 years ago. Okay. Is that fair, I just don't want people to think that they're raising taxes without a vote because we actually did vote, and the Supreme Court said we did. CDE screwed it up, and that's what we're trying to figure out. Does that and help? We will think that we did it without a vote, I imagine. Right, so we have to talk about it in, yeah. in ways, and it's accurate. If we hadn't voted, we wouldn't have been able to do this. Okay, so vote? it was 100 years ago, didn't you hear? I think she's <laughs> exaggerating. It's just a little. <laughs> Bill could probably tell us when we voted, but it was probably in the 90s. Yeah, it was like 96. Yeah, it would be about the right time. That's when most of them happened. So why didn't we come up to 27 then? The Department of Education tells us what the mill is, and they, uh, the determination is that they illegally lowered districts' mills. Um, obviously, they thought they were doing the right thing, but um, they lowered mills related to the, the ratchet effect of Tabor, that it should have gone down when uh, or they thought that it should have gone down when it should have stayed at the amount that we had debruised at. And actually, it was higher for us at that point in time. I was going to say, Kitty, the 27 is arbitrary, but that's what it is in statute, so we're kind of stuck with that for a while. Okay. Yeah, I think we were 32 or 36 uh, mills when we actually debruised. So we voted to debruise 100 years ago, and then... CDE said, no, you can't have all those mills that your people voted to give you. Okay. Um, what they kind of done is the, the mill went down, we collected less money locally, and the state share kicked in. Right. So we didn't lose money, but the system lost money. Right. Well, that seems silly. Right. So now they're trying to rectify that to have the system uh, collect the money that it should. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And two of the four districts, did Steamboat go this fall? Uh, Cherry Creek and, and uh, District 11 in Colorado Springs both passed their deep bruising measure this past fall. Uh, and I think it's only Harrison and uh, Route County uh, one of the routes that are uh, remaining that haven't passed that debruising uh, ballot. Because the district has to go ask the voters to do that. 
so um, this is a next page is page eight. Uh, so this is just a calculation uh, for a, a property owner uh, to go through the math of uh, determining how mills work, what assessed valuation is, um, and then also uh, some indication of the overlapping property tax rates, because it can get confusing uh, if, depending on whether you're in a special district, uh, the city, the, the county, um, the uh, various debt, you know, whether it's a library district or a metropolitan district or um, fire protection districts, like they all have uh, some, some different uh, measures that they've asked uh, over the years for property taxes. And so this is just kind of an indication that there are differences even within Boulder Valley. And uh, while um, the school district can tend to be the one of the larger um, property tax impacts on somebody's bill, there are actually uh, more things on there than just the school district. Page nine, uh, has a couple of graphs. So this is where we get into the comparison what we consider uh, or have been using as our peer districts for a number of years. Uh, so these are the top 10 largest districts uh, in Colorado plus Littleton. Uh, we've included Littleton for a long time as a comparable district uh, from uh, number one, the amount of overrides that they have uh, and have passed over the years, uh, as well as achievement levels and uh, poverty levels, things like that. Um, there's there's lots of opportunity to uh, think about what a comparable district is on on different levels. So when it comes to um, uh, competing for uh, uh, staff, we probably don't compare as well to Colorado Springs District 11 as far as getting staff to come in but Westminster would be a better comparable, but we don't really compare ourselves with Westminster uh, on the financial side because they're so much smaller. So again, this is the, the districts that we have chosen and have used for quite, uh, quite a number of years uh, as our comparables, uh, mostly from, from that size factor. So the top chart uh, shows that difference in local uh, funding in the School Finance Act. Uh, versus how much the state is providing. Uh, the state portion is in the dark blue uh, and the local uh, property tax is in the light blue. Uh, the little yellow bit on the end is the specific ownership tax, which is from car registrations. Uh, a lot of nuance around what that actually is. It's a relatively small amount uh, overall of, of the funding. Uh, but you can see we are at the top of the scale from the local uh, funding standpoint. Uh, and the base school finance act, uh, we're kind of right in the middle. We're fairly close to the statewide average of funding in the school finance act. Uh, but the chart at the bottom, when we layer on uh, the local override funding, uh, that bumps us up to the, the top funded uh, within this group. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, we're, we're very lucky to have the support that we have uh, from the local voters uh, to provide that uh, additional funding. Page 10. Uh, so this graphic is really just to help people understand the community uh, that, um, you know, what is really controllable when it comes to funding for us, um, uh, more controllable. So there are some uh, decisions that get made around tuition. Uh, there's a very few students that we actually charge tuition for. They're uh, particular kind of visa students. We had none this year uh, because of the pandemic. So um, uh, there's some also decisions around um, uh, some of the special programs and that, that we have that have tuition associated with them. Um, but, and then the, the uh, local override elections, uh, those are, again, not the decisions the board has, that certainly is to put it out to the voters, but um, from the local perspective, uh, the local voters have the decision to support uh, K-12 education with more funding. Uh, 
uh, when you start getting into the School Finance Act, there's very little control that we have uh, other than through the political process and working with the legislature and our legislators uh, within that. So again, just a reminder for folks that uh, uh, how much is, is uh, within these sort of large groups of, of funding streams. Uh, page 11, uh, just a few uh, bullet points um, of uh, override uh, revenue, free and reduced lunch. Um, our total funded student membership that we have on here, this 29, that's our funded um, membership, so the students in the system. So this is uh, inclusive of that drop in students that we have. Um, this doesn't include the averaging, so this is the, the bodies in the system, um, so down significantly from last year. Uh, and then categorical reimbursements at the bottom, uh, so this is special ed, transportation, uh, English Language Proficiency Act, uh, and Talented and Gifted, which is a very small amount. Uh, so there's a component of the School Finance Act uh, with that categorical reimbursement. It's also categorical funding is protected by Amendment 23 in a much stronger manner than the School Finance Act itself. Uh, there is no negative factor applied to uh, categorical revenue that the legislature has to increase the amount by inflation every year. Um, certainly that puts pressure on the system so that uh, the negative factor might need to increase to make the whole system work. Uh, but at least the bucket of money that this uh, is identified as uh, is protected by Amendment 23. Uh, page 12, uh, so we're getting into the, um, the overrides and just a, a you know, little bit more information. Um, the transportation fund, so uh, pointing out that that is one of those additional overrides that we have available to us. Um, we do transfer uh, almost $7 million uh, into transportation from the general fund. So that is an opportunity uh, that the board has to go back to the voters uh, to request additional funding. So we could get uh, some, it's not in the grand scheme of things, it's not a, a significant amount, uh, but you know, seven to eight, seven to $10 million uh, is not insignificant. Uh, for additional funding that would be available uh, in another um, override election uh, for transportation. Uh, the Capital Construction Maintenance and Technology Fund, uh, this was passed in 2016. Uh, we're collecting um, uh, almost $30 million uh, in this fund. Uh, we are transferring expenditures out of the general fund into this fund for uh, largely for uh, maintenance, the maintenance operations and technology as authorized by it. Um, we do have an ending balance. It's one-time dollars in that fund. Uh, this is where we purchased uh, the building for Justice High out of. Uh, so it's uh, intended for, um, or I would suggest it's for uh, capital construction. Uh, we are paying for our ERP implementation out of here. Uh, so uh, it's an ongoing revenue stream. We are moving on. We have moved ongoing expenditures into it, uh, but there is some fund balance available in there. Uh, the um, board policy DB that defines um, what is ongoing revenue and ongoing expenditures and available uh, resources to spend. Um, so we do that calculation in the budget process. And uh, th this is just that, that sort of presentation of it. Um, and it's to really make sure that we're on sound financial footing from year to year, that we have identified expenses as one-time expenses uh, so that we don't have a reoccurring problem going into the next year. Um, so nothing earth shattering there, it's just uh, within the, um, presented in the uh, budget adoption uh, process. Page 15, uh, we're getting into the, the 
breakout of the uh, total funds for um, what we call the the combined uh, general fund. Uh, so it's it's larger, more than just the the general operating fund. Um, but just again to give some perspective of the changes over time, uh, this has become a little confusing uh, because of that transfer of expenses over to the uh, operations and technology fund. Uh, those asterisk lines down towards the bottom for operations and maintenance and central support services where uh, technology sits uh, has been dropping as we have transferred more of those expenses out of this fund. Um, so it's not that we have cut our operations and maintenance uh, expenditures from 23 million down to 6 million. Uh, that's how much we've uh, transferred out of the general fund and over to that operations and technology fund. Uh, this next page is just the percentage um, of each of those uh, spending areas. Uh, this graph here on page 17, this is one of my favorite ones because it's, it's CDE data. So this is uh, information we, we submit our expenses. Every district submits their expenses uh, to the state. And uh, so this is pulling in those peer districts, uh, those 11 peer districts, including Boulder, uh, and comparing our categories of spending to the average of those peers. And so uh, it becomes pretty clear in here where we are spending less on operational support than our peer average. Uh, and more on teachers than our peer average. We're a little bit higher uh, in the administration side. Uh, that includes uh, school administration. So I think that's really important to point out uh, that, um, and we've looked at this a number of times over the years, uh, Boulder has typically smaller schools than other, some other districts. So what you see when you have one principal in a school, that drives up the school administration costs, uh, the fixed costs uh, associated with a school. So not necessarily uh, that we have a lot of administration per se, but we have a lot of small schools uh, compared to some other districts. Uh, the other one that's really notable on here is the textbooks and materials. Uh, it's almost half. Uh, of what that peer average is. Um, so again, this, this shows where we're investing our resources uh, and where we're not um, compared to the, that peer group. Kitty? Kitty. Yes, the question on the, the page, I'm flipping back between where I can read it and, and this screen. So the page before 16, there's a line that says general administration 1.37%. Does that include is that the like the ed center administration uh, yeah. uh, general administration uh, includes um, uh, superintendents uh, area as well as um, the school boards in there um, property tax collections we actually have to pay a quarter percent of uh, the collections on property taxes to the uh, county treasurer uh, for the privilege of collecting our taxes for us uh, and paying them over to us. Um, but all that is included in there. So that's a, a better representation of, um, it, it, is, it is a very small slice of what most people would consider central administration. Um, IT and HR are both included in that line further down as central support services. Okay. Communications is in there. Um, so it's, it's uh, a little mixed. Okay. But at least in that page 17, the comparison is including all of that administration side of things uh, and is apples to apples across school districts. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
page 18. Uh, so the graph at the top, uh, again, this is CDE data. So this is our, uh, collectively, we submit uh, uh, December 1st uh, staff data uh, to, to the department. And uh, this is the student teacher ratio. So every uh, teacher in the district is associated with the school. Um, and uh, so on CDE's website, you can actually find this student teacher ratio for every school in the state. Uh, this is collectively uh, regular education teachers. So it's going to include art, music, and PE at the elementary level and those specials throughout the system. It includes special education and it includes Title I teachers. So again, CDE doesn't break that out separately. They include those uh, three groups together. Um, but we can see uh, that last year we had uh, a drop in the number of uh, students per teacher, uh, as did uh, that peer average as well. Um, so this wasn't intentional. There wasn't a board action to uh, decrease class sizes or anything. Uh, this is just kind of a natural progression. We know we were overstaffed in some cases. Um, I believe that when we get to this next uh, cycle, um, we will, and collectively with our peers, we'll see a fairly significant drop in this number, uh, a much lower student-teacher ratio, uh, just because of what's happened during the pandemic. A loss of students overall, and generally speaking, uh, maintaining those staffing levels uh, within districts. So um, it'll be a, a definitely anomaly year uh, for this current fiscal year once we uh, get that information out of uh, CDE. Uh, the chart at the bottom of page 18 there just has uh, the enrollment counts. Uh, so uh, again, this is last year, so not the drop that we saw uh, this fall. Um, that'll stand out, obviously, fairly significant uh, next time we compare this. Um, but uh, just kind of showing those changes, um, that five-year change within districts uh, is, is fairly significant. Um, so uh, definitely shifts uh, across the state. Uh, this is our student population information. So this is what we call the special programs report. It's available on our website uh, in the uh, enrollment office um, staff or student statistics that are in there. Just the counts and percentages of the, the various groups of students. Uh, again, we've been pulling this information together for a very long time, uh, years and years of, of history on this. Uh, and this is something that we do go to fairly regularly to um, just uh, see where changes are happening. Every school is listed with all this information. So uh, this is just the summary side of that report. Uh, student outcomes. So this was a, a challenging year to present much uh, since we didn't have reports um, or a, a testing happen last spring for the most part. Uh, so, um, you know, we've, we've pulled in what we can. We have our graduation rate and dropout rate uh, that was uh, reported just last week, I guess. Um, so uh, that's all that we have for that information. We had uh, last year, uh, the document had some uh, student outcomes uh, relative to the uh, math and literacy, I believe. Um, so at the point when we start collecting that information again, we'll, we'll get back on track with that. Uh, we have a couple of pages in here on the bond program and capital improvement, capital planning. Uh, so um, again, the board gets regular updates on this, uh, but we do have uh, some notes in here about the impacts to the budget. So certainly there are uh, impacts to the budget when there's uh, capital expenditures that happen, whether it's expanding the footprint of schools and adding square footage uh, that can uh, increase utility uh, usage. Obviously, we have a fairly significant um, effort to uh, reduce those utility usages uh, with our sustainability program. 
we get rebates from Excel. Um, good. So again, just a, a note within the budget process of those budget impacts that can occur uh, from uh, capital expenditures. Phase 24 is the uh, budget milestones uh, presentation. So uh, it's the same information uh, that we presented back in December. So again, just a, a little different layout, uh, vertical instead of horizontal. Um, was there a question? Nope, okay. Um, then moving on to page 25, uh, so a little note in here about the governor's budget uh, proposal from back in November. Um, it was uh, much better than I think a lot of folks anticipated. It was much better than I anticipated. Um, uh, restoration of the cuts that were made last uh, legislative session. Um, the December forecast, uh, the, the state revenue forecast was a, once again um, positive. Uh, and I wrote down a note of uh, Kate Watkins, the state economist, um, presented at the Colorado School Finance Project last week. Uh, and she said, we're continuing to see the general fund revenue come in stronger than expected. Uh, so uh, that is definitely a positive outlook. We're not out of the woods. Um, a lot of the economy is um, banking on uh, vaccines rolling out and the distribution going well. Uh, and the economic outlook that is in here uh, as it's noted, it is uh, directly from the presentation uh, that uh, the Colorado Business Economic Outlook uh, and the Business Research Division at, at uh, Leeds puts together. Um, I won't belabor the outlook uh, because it, um, there's been certainly a lot of reporting on it. Uh, the drop off was significant but the return was fairly rapid uh, in some sectors of the economy. Uh, it's being referred to as a, a K recovery. So if you can envision what a K looks like, you have a quick return on the economy, but there are some pieces that are continuing to fall. So, uh, you know, it's, it's no surprise that there are a number of restaurants that are still closed or closing. Um, and the, the tourism is going to be hard hit this winter. Um, so uh, there will be impacts felt from the, 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 the slow return of some major pieces of the Colorado economy. But uh, again, these are just a few highlights of uh, employment growth, um, population. Um, uh, Elizabeth Garner, the state demographer presented at the Colorado School Finance Project uh, as well last week. And <clears throat> the projection for the economy um, it, or for the population uh, is borne out in the trends that were, no pun intended, uh, in the trends that we're seeing uh, with uh, smaller classes, smaller uh, numbers of students in the early grades uh, has to do with statewide um, uh, birth trend data. Um, the number of people moving into the state, the cost of housing, all of those things are, are sort of uh, put into this. But Colorado is still a very attractive place uh, to move to, as we all know. So uh, again, I would encourage folks to look into uh, that um, document that's available uh, on the web uh, for the outlook. It's it's quite fascinating and they cover um, multiple <coughs> um, pieces of the economy as well as various areas of the state. They do have uh, Boulder County specifically on page 28. So this is information on Boulder County, um, which is very strong uh, and has been. Uh, but uh, 
all the areas of the state are represented uh, and described in there. So on page 29 is when we start getting into um, the uh, assumptions um, that we will be using as we start moving forward with building budget. So <clears throat> the official inflation number did come out uh, like Tuesday of last week. Uh, it came in at 2% uh, for the 2020 calendar year. Um, the governor's original proposal was at 1.7%, so it's up a little bit higher than that. Uh, that will have to get built into all of the calculations at the state level. Um, it does put more pressure uh, on the state as it's required to increase funding uh, in so many places based on that. Um, but uh, it's, it is the number that it is, and, and so we'll uh, move forward with that assumption. Uh, employee compensation, so we had our work session last week uh, on the uh, negotiations that we'll be going into uh, with our employee groups. So <clears throat> expectations around uh, cost of living, uh, impacts on health and dental, uh, working conditions, all of that will, will be impacted. Um, student population, so I've got uh, some notes in here. Uh, Typically, we just have the one projection for next year uh, that we would include in this, uh, but I thought it was important to have that three years in there because um, while we're projecting a, a, a little bit of a bounce back in the number of students, uh, it still has a fairly significant drop over those three years. Uh, so we'll continue to be uh, averaging uh, within the School Finance Act uh, and it is very difficult projection uh, for student counts for next year um, as we're uh, taking a best guess really about uh, what the choices folks will make on returning uh, to education, uh, K-12. Uh, staffing adjustments, so this will also be very challenging for next year. Uh, so in the current year, we have a fairly significant amount of staffing um, on one-time funding, about $10 million. So uh, we want to build that in as a restoration of, of uh, ongoing funding for that to the extent that the uh, governor's proposal plays out in the, in the way presented. Um, we have uh, the remote synchronous learning, uh, as well as remote asynchronous learning, so Boulder Universal, uh, and the return to more normal operations of schools in the fall, um, and what those choices that folks will make uh, for their students, um, and what it will take to, to staff that, that model. And then this the student decline, while we do um, last year, we projected a five-year, about 200 student per year decline. Um, we expect that return of students that we had such a dramatic drop this year. And uh, I would suggest that it would be um, not the best choice to uh, blanket reduce staff overall in the district to meet the level of students that we have if it's only a year or two problem um, because then you have to go through the hiring process to get those folks back again and it's very expensive and impactful to the system. So uh, we have a balancing act of keeping the appropriate number of people uh, on staff to support that remote synchronous learning and, and the choices that people make in the fall. Um, and also be prepared for that return of students uh, in a year or so. Uh, budget stabilization factor, so a reduction of that for next year uh, with, from the governor's proposal. Uh, so about $20 million change in that. Um, so uh, very, very strong. Um, move by the governor to support uh, education. I think he realizes that 
uh, as the pandemic has played out, how important K-12 education is to the economy uh, and the structure that we have uh, to support um, employment. Uh, we have contractual price escalations, uh, operational expenditures, uh, implementation of any updated strategic uh, plan initiatives. Uh, we'll certainly have some level of remediation uh, that will be needed for students that are impacted uh, by this year and last year. Uh, full expectation that there will be continuing uh, COVID-19 related expenditures, uh, anything from additional staffing to additional custodial support. Um, you know, we don't really know at this point in time, but certainly have an expectation around that. Uh, and then we also want to be prepared for any uh, additional federal funding uh, that comes through. The uh, Biden administration has already put a proposal out there, uh, which is even additional funding over what was just passed uh, back in December. So, um, you know, keeping an eye out for that, what kind of restrictions there are, uh, how those funds can be used. Uh, and so um, keeping that all within the, the budget development process as well. Uh, let's see, page 30 has a few links uh, to financial information for the district, um, as well as uh, some state information, CDE, things like that, again, to make it easy for uh, the public to access that. And that's the end. So I'll leave the presentation up for a little bit just so that uh, if anybody wants to reference a page, I can get back to it pretty easy. Okay, thanks. Um, I can't see everyone, so if I could just go alphabetical, Ali. Um, Richard, do you have any questions? Not right now, Tina. Let me come back. I'm I'm still looking at this thing here. Okay, doke. Kathy? Nope, I don't really. I mean, a few words smithing things here and there, but not really. Thanks. Okay, uh, Kitty? Hang on, I was looking at it on a different. Um, no, I'm fine, thanks. Okay, Lisa. Sorry, I've got two mute buttons here. Uh, also good. Okay. Um, Stacy. No questions. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Um, and I just, I just had a question about. Um, and this doesn't need to be part of this, is when do we start costing out the funds we need to recover from the pandemic? I know we mentioned the broad umbrella of COVID-19 remediation, et cetera, but do we put numbers to those at some point? Or, and I understand it's a moving target. Uh, <clears throat> short answer, yes. Uh, longer answer, um, making the determination about what's needed, um, you know, that's what will take the time. Uh, once that determination is made, we can start to put numbers to things. Um, and so, uh, to some extent, they're unknown at the, at the moment uh, as we're just trying to deal with the situation um, uh, without the, the testing to be able to compare. Um, it, it becomes just local testing. Uh, so any um, assessments that are done locally uh, would tell us against the benchmark uh, for that test if it's a national uh, benchmark test. But, um, you know, there's mental health uh, issues that will need to be dealt with. Um, and so it's a it's a large basket, or shall we say, multiple baskets of things that will need to be looked at. Okay. And then I'm also wondering, when we meet with um, city councils, whether we should try to provide them an electronic copy of this prior to meeting. It might They might be curious um, about our budget. And I think this is a good way to communicate it, just so we make sure that we're using this since you're putting so much effort into it. Um, I think that's a good idea, Tina. Absolutely. I think we can do that. 
All right. Other questions coming to mind? We contemplate this. And and this isn't really a prioritization. It's more of a snapshot plus the history of why we are where we are. And then the piece on the assumptions, one of the things the board has talked about over the years is how specific should those assumptions be? Should they be out three to five years? You know, we've gone back and forth with all of those. I think where we are is in a pretty good place so that you get an idea of what is being fed into our budget um, because we're at a point in this case where we don't know exactly what all the numbers are. Now the, the, the inflation is a big one, so we do know that one, but is that a fair description, Bill? Yeah, it's really, um... I mean, the, the structure of school finance in Colorado is hard to project out too far because the legislature has that ability to make those choices. Um, the, the budget stabilization factor is still a thing and they can make those choices. Uh, certainly there's um, a strong support for public education uh, right now, um, but there, the legislature is constrained by uh, the resources that come in. Um, enrollment, uh, were just a lot of things were thrown out the window uh, last year and this year and going into next year. So that's going to change our, um, the, the range of what the projection is uh, in the short term, we're really just um, making an assumption of how many students uh, that we lost in this current year will return quickly. Um, and th this is not unique to us. This is every district up and down the front range and around the state uh, that saw enrollment impacts um, well outside of what the, the norm was. Um, so there are some things that we can project out uh, for a few years. Um, but the variation becomes so wide that that really, um, uh, I don't know how helpful it becomes um, if you're talking, you know, the, the variation out there a number of years being 20 or 30 or 40 million dollar difference, um, it, your, the actions that need to be taken uh, get pretty drastic if you're trying to dial in uh, that kind of breadth of projection. Do, you, do we need to add at all that um, we, even though we had this big enrollment drop this year, that, that, that we have a pretty clear trend that just will be continuing to decline? Because um, it almost, because it looks a little bit like we're going to have a recovery. And I think to set expectations, we might want to be clear that we don't really expect growth over five years. That was um, part of the, the attempt I made to, to put the three years in there where right, we had right. a decline of 162, a decline of 1,600, and then a return of 275. Uh, right. We're still well down over three years. Um, uh, I could very easily add a bullet, another bullet to that that says, you know, what the, the natural uh, projection was about 200 students per year for five years. I can yeah. kind of work that in there. Okay. Yeah, because I don't, I don't think there's any chance we'll kind of get more families in parts of our district from what we can tell, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, Richard. Thanks, Tina. Uh, Bill, you know, I'm in the, uh, what page am I on? 19, we're talking about the student population. And I'm looking at the number of VLL students or English language learners. And it's gone, it's gone down significantly by almost 500 students um, from last year to this year, or at least the projected one. Uh, is that based on the access testing? Uh, this is a specific number that um, I think I'll have to get back to you on that. I, okay. I want to say that it is the um, the students within the 
it's the three to five year window of um, NEP, LEP, and FEP, mm -hmm. non-English proficient, limited, and fully English proficient, sort of that, that definite, the state definition of, of English proficiency. Um, and so what students fall within that group, um, but we can uh, yeah. get a better response than that. Yeah, that would be, that would be cool because I, this is going to the public and I'm sure people are going to start looking at, at that a little bit more with a magnifying glass in terms of student enrollment and what does that mean? And then the other one is the FRL. I mean, it, you would, I would have expected it to go higher in terms of the pandemic, but it seemed like it's a decline too. Well, that's yeah. one of the um, impacts that has been seen uh, across the state with the uh, elimination of the requirement to fill out the form uh -huh. to receive free lunch. Um, which has been great that we don't have to go through that process and we've been able to uh, hand out those food resources to families um, that the, the recorded students has dropped. Um, and so uh, not that those students aren't still with us, they just didn't have to fill out the forms, the families didn't have to fill yeah. out the forms. So that's based on that form that they have to fill out? Yep. Okay. Uh, and then when I go to the uh, following page on the student outcomes, I can understand the percentages, but you know when I look at uh, the raw the raw numbers of Hispanic students, uh, I don't know. I keep getting this figure in my head about 5,000 Hispanic students, and uh, this is graduation it seems like. Um, so you're talking about high school students in this one here, or is that? When you look at it, Hispanic students at a plus 1% numbers that went up or gained. My curiosity is, and, and we can talk about this later if you want, but what does that number look like in raw numbers? I'm, you know, like. Is it a hundred students? What what is that? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we got this information from Jonathan uh, Ding, so we'll have to get some of those details on it. Okay. I, do you want me to do an RFI on that, or will you just get that information? Um, I would say it'd probably be helpful to have that uh, written down. So if you could submit that, that'd be great. Okay, and the same thing applies to the dropout rate. Okay, I'll do that. Because I would be curious to find out how many Latino students we have that have dropped out in terms of real numbers, not the percentages. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions come to mind? So, a quick question, are we going to print this out this year or just go electronic and save the money? Yeah. I like it. We don't have anything able to hand it out. <laughs> They'll just sit on my desk. All right. And I'm assuming it's going to be in Spanish. Uh, we, yes, we, could. Uh, we haven't historically created this uh, in Spanish, but uh, we can run it through the um, translation department. Certainly. That'd be great because I think it's an important document especially when you start talking about uh, explaining how School Finance Act works and all of that. And let's, um, and I think Richard, to your point, I started out with who reads this and who do we give it to? Um, and I, what? Everybody. Everybody, I know everyone is, is like, oh, it's coming out. Wow, let's check our mailbox. Um, but I, I think if we think about so this started really for the board and for DAC primarily, but if we think of it more as a community facing document, when we interact with people who are most likely to read it, like the like our committees, the budget advisory committee or CAPL or whoever, we just may want to casually ask for feedback on how they did it because 
having it, the board do it, we, we do understand this mill levy thing, although now that we have both a mill levy for property and a mill levy override, I'm not I'm sort of losing it on that one, but um, just making sure that it, it, it makes sense to the people reading it. Um, and then also understanding who's even reading it. So, you know, we have lots of different ways that we communicate the budget. Some of our presentations that we do in the next two months are, are really, I think, very easily um, communicated and somewhat, in some ways easier to understand than this one. So um, it might be that there are different types of, that we, you know, we appreciate the different types that we communicate our budget or present it. Um, so let's keep getting feedback because we do actually, I know you spent a lot of time doing this, so that's all I've got. All right, anything else or an hour is good for Tuesday? Yes, yeah, Simon here has a question. <laughs> oh, Simon. <laughs> All right, with that, um, good night, and uh, that's it. Bye.